Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that has looked after us, not just throughout this day, but throughout all the days of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you're helping us to see more clearly the day in which you are about to make your appearing. And you want us to be prepared and to prepare as many as is willing. So I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to realize the great responsibility that is placed upon each of us. And as evangelists, our first place of evangelism is our home. And once we have the victory in the home, to bring that to the church and to the world. So I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see how much you're loving us, Lord, and how much you desire to take sin away from us, that we can reflect your glory, your character, to a world that is filled with darkness. We pray, Lord, that even the fellowship that we have one to another, that it will be as if you were in our midst, that we will not hold anything in our hearts, enmity towards one another, but desiring, Lord, to put things all right, as they did during the time of the 1840 and 1844 time period. So we just thank you, Lord, for being in our midst. We thank you for all the messages that we have received. And as the speaker is about to speak, we pray, Lord, that you'll touch his mind and open up his mouth with words of wisdom that we may be watered according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In, we're in the middle of this study, and you may not see the connection to the daily, but I hope we'll tie that together for you. But if you would, turn with me to Daniel 8 and verse 9. Now, I think, I hope that at least now, while it's only an hour or so, a couple hours since we went over this, I hope we see that in verse 8, the key that Daniel left for us was in the Hebrew language in the fact that he placed some of the words in the feminine and masculine, which we can't see in the King James Version. But for those of us that aren't familiar with languages, some languages do and some don't. The English language doesn't employ masculine and feminine. But some languages do employ the masculine and feminine. The one that I'm most familiar with is Spanish. Um, a young boy in Spanish is a mu muchacho. The O is what identifies the masculine in the Spanish. The A is what identifies the feminine in the Spanish. And a young girl is a muchacha. Uh, a, a smaller child is a niño. A boy, a small, a small boy, a small girl is a niña. So it, it's the O and the A in the Spanish language the O and the A, that allows you to tell whether it's masculine or feminine. And there are many languages that do employ masculine and feminine, and Hebrew is one of them. And Daniel employs this technique in verse 8 by making a distinction between the four notable horns and the four winds. And of course, we can't see this in the King James. This is something that a, a theologian dug out for us. That's why we gave everyone the book Mystery of the Daily. But Daniel begins to oscillate between masculine and feminine as he goes down through verses 9, 10, 11, 12. And of course, in the first verse, after he talks about the four notable horns and the four winds, in verse 9, out of one of them uh, came forth a little horn. This little horn is in the masculine, and this is the subject from here on out. And the theologian went through and shows that as the little horn is addressed in each of the following verse, verse 9, it's masculine pagan Rome, verse 10, feminine papal Rome, verse 11, masculine pagan Rome, verse 12, feminine papal Rome. But Gabi noticed in, since our last presentation that after the little horn of pagan Rome is established in verse 9, that then in verses 10 and 12, the little horn, 10 and 12 now, I'm not dealing with verse 11, 10 and 12, the little horn is identified as it, which the theologians will tell you this is feminine. So when Daniel's using it here, 
without knowing the feminine or masculine, we can know from our own studies that this is papal Rome. But here in verse 11, it's not it, it's he, which is obviously masculine. So if you look at the it in verse 10 and know that it isn't the he, then it is the opposite of he, it's feminine. He in verse 11, masculine, pagan Rome. And the subject in verse 12, it says, and a host was given him. You'll notice this him, even though it's accurate to the masculine uh, tense, so to speak, it's it, to the subject, I guess. I don't know my language that well to be clear about it, but we know the him is an added word because it's italicized. And if you're going to focus into the subject, into the, the words that are actually in the verse, the subject is down here at the end of verse 12 where it says, it, it cast down the truth to the ground and it practice. And once again, it's not he, it's it. It's the feminine in agreement with the studies of John Peters in the mystery of the daily. And so if just to remind ourselves that in verse 11, what we were dealing with here is the daily. In verse 11, and then we'll move out of this, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. The he here, pagan Rome, stood, stood against Christ at the cross. And by, and this word by is best translated as through, and through him, through pagan Rome, paganism was lifted up and exalted. And this is the characteristic of pagan Rome as it conquered the world and brought all the pagan idols into one place in the pantheon. Now notice in this verse, the, the, the information in this verse is consistent with itself. It's talking about pagan Rome standing against Christ. It's talking about pagan Rome exalting paganism. And the, the last phrase is in agreement with that because it says, and the place of his sanctuary, the place of paganism sanctuary was the city of Rome. And it's talking about how pagan Rome exalted paganism, and it did so by bringing these idols back to the city of Rome and placing them in this sanctuary called the Pantheon. So the, the verse is consistent with itself. It's talking about the same thing from beginning to end. It's identifying a characteristic of pagan Rome. The, the key word, of course, take away there means to lift up and exalt. If you turn to Daniel eleven thirty one. And remember, in verse 30, we have went over it. Verse 30 is pagan Rome, the last phrase, having intelligence with the papacy, with them that forsake the holy covenant. And it says, and arms, the military power of pagan Rome shall stand on the papacy's part. And the military power of pagan Rome shall pollute the city of Rome, which is the sanctuary of Rome's strength. And pagan Rome shall remove paganism from its profession and the three pagan horns on top of it and pagan Rome shall place the papacy the abomination that make it desolate so here the word take away means remove in Daniel 8 it means lift up and exalt so what does this have to do with the pattern of Christ and uh, the pattern of Christ here um, I, I, it never fails, I, and it's, I, don't, I don't know how to get around it. I try to, I try to forewarn um, the audience several times, but it, this is a stumbling block in here. It is, particularly if you haven't uh, uh, been dealing with theoretical prophecy, and by that I mean um, things that are more abstract than just direct history. If you're not familiar with do, dealing with some of the theories in prophecy, um, this can be tricky, and some of the things that people, I say stumble over, but I don't, I don't in any way mean stumble in terms of sin. Some of the things that people stumble over here, uh, you could even leave out to make them, to prevent them from stumbling. But I don't want to do that. So I want to go over this again. What we're saying here, is that Christ had 30 years of preparation before he was baptized and received power and he gave his testimony for three and a half years. Now don't even worry about the three and a half years. It's just a way mark. It's more of a, a literary mark than it is the 1260 year, 24 hour periods of time. Okay? And the next way mark is that Christ was crucified. But we also know that in his testimony there was a three and a half year period where his testimony was carried on by his disciples. I realize 
that this three and a half years goes way beyond the resurrection and ascension, but we're talking about laying out symbolic way marks and just treating this three and a half as a, a symbol. But it, it, from, from what I see, it's not a very important symbol. You could erase it, but I, I dislike doing that because how do I know? how much this is really, maybe I haven't seen the importance of significance, I've seen it, but I don't know how important it is yet, so I have to leave it there, uh, because it's there. After his death, we know of his resurrection and his ascension, and then the fall of Babylon is illustrated in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, because the destruction of Jerusalem is a history that inspiration has identified as representing what takes place when Michael stands up, and the seven last plagues are fall, falling in the fall of Babylon is complete, and this leads up to the second coming of Christ, which was symbolically represented when Christ came to Patmos in A.D. 100. Notice that even the pattern, the history is right, uh, gets us down here, A.D. 70, A.D. 100 at the Isle of Patmos. In Revelation 11, uh, the first way mark of preparation, as Duane and I were discussing in between uh, this, that meeting and this meeting, Probably you would say the Reformation time period was the preparation time period, but the, it isn't there. It's implied based on the other patterns. And Revelation 11, speaking of the Word of God, uh, that it was empowered, it gave its testimony for three and a half years, and then it, it um, received its death, and then for three and a half days it stood, it stood up, it ascended to heaven, then we see illustrated... Um, the French Revolution, which another um, historical illustration of the fall of Babylon, seven last plagues, and then the second coming, coming is encompassed in the third woe. So, the next pattern of Christ. These are both patterns of Christ. This is Christ when he was on earth, and this is Christ in the Old and New Testament. And then we have the pattern of Antichrist. And we're suggesting that there was a preparation period for Antichrist. And what would, if you were going to mark a date for the beginning of the preparation period for Antichrist, what would you mark? 508. And how long of time before the papacy was in power? That would bring us to 538. Now, if you stop right there, you see that the the Antichrist is perfectly walking in the pattern of Christ. 30 years, 30 years. And he is empowered, and how long does the papacy give its testimony? Three and a half years, but is it really three and a half years? So you, you can't be trying to force these numbers into a box, they're, they're symbolic. And at the end of the 1260 years, what happens to the papacy? It receives its deadly wound. When? 1798. Do you see that the papacy walks the same pattern of Christ? The Antichrist walks the same pattern of Christ. I better check my notes here. Uh, and from the time, Daniel 12, 1, and from the time that the daily should be taken away and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there should be 1,290 days. Brothers and sisters, when was the daily taken away? 508. 508. And according to this verse, the daily being removed, what's it in connection with doing? Setting up the papacy. Which right there, and it will go for 1,290 years, bringing us to 1798. Now, brothers and sisters, if you and I think the daily represents the work that Christ is doing in, in the heavenly sanctuary, what, what does this have to do with 508? No, no, no. <laughs> he has nothing is the word. So, in 1798, the deadly wound was delivered to the papacy, and it, after 30 years of preparation, it ruled for 1,260 years. Um, 
power was given to it. You, you have these quotes in your note. This is um, easy material here for us. What are we waiting for now? A quote that we've referred to at least three times in this presentation. Prophecy tells of what? A restoration of her power. The deadly wound is healed. The difference with the pattern of Antichrist and the pattern of Christ and the pattern of Christ in the Word of God is that this part of the pattern is still future. We're waiting for the resurrection of the papacy. When the deadly wound is healed, the papacy does what? Ascends where? To whose throne? Maybe. But there is a power that agrees to give their kingdom unto the beast. The ten kings give their kingdom unto the beast and it ascends that throne. And shortly thereafter, what happens? Babylon falls fully and completely. The king of the north comes to his end and none shall help here in this time period of the seven last plagues. And that culminates with the second coming of Christ. Here's, this here is an argument <coughs> that the theologians that want to teach that the daily is Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, they, they haven't addressed yet. They need to address this one. We want to hear the response to this one. But here's another thought. Where is the clearest passage in Scripture that tells the story of the resurrection, ascension, fall of Babylon, and the second coming of Christ in terms of the Antichrist? Where would you find that in Scripture? Daniel 11. Daniel 11, what verses? 11 to 40 to 45. Brothers and sisters, this ties into Daniel 11. Let's see how many notes I've passed by. There, here's a quote for you. Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin. The fall of Babylon, the seven last plagues. And now there's one more pattern of Christ. At least one more. I don't know that, you know. And it's the pattern of Adventism. Um, you see, this is a worthwhile quote before we get there. Um, the scenes connected with the working of the man of sin are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. The pattern of the 144,000, the pattern of Adventism. Christ Object Lessons, page 69. The remnant is a type of Christ. When the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim him as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. We are a type of Christ. Adventism was raised up with the very purpose of reflecting the character of Christ to a dying world. And Adventism walks through this identical pattern. Now, when's the preparation for Adventism? Uh, and although I don't, I don't have a proof text for this, I would suggest to you that 1833 began the preparation when William Miller began to be raised up and proclaim his message. What's the next thing we should expect to see? Power. Power. August 11, 1840. August 11th, 1840. Everyone agree? Everyone say amen? 1840, power comes into the movement of Adventism. Roughly, 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 not, not right on the nose, but roughly three and a half years, you know, four years later, let's be honest, but three and a half years is pretty close, but we're not worrying about the time here in this pattern. When, what should we expect to see next? Death. Great disappointment. When was that? 1844? Why are we saying death here? 
Yes, I, I, I realize that, but if you get, get that detailed, you will really put some stumbling blocks on a videotape. We could turn it off and we could discuss that among friends here, no problem, but this will be reviewed by the critics. Um, the death, October 22nd, 1844, you can line up prophetically very easily with the cross. It is the history that Sister White goes back to over and over again to explain the disappointment of the disciples. Um, there, there, we're going to do some in future studies, but the cross aligns with October 22nd, 1844, and the cross aligns with the Passover. And there are two histories uh, which Sister White uses to describe the disappointment of October 23rd, 1844. The primary one is the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross. The other one is the disappointment of the children of Israel as they stood in front of the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army behind them. Octo October 22nd, 1844, Adventism spiritually died. Now, as the Antichrist pattern, so is the pattern of the 144,000 or Adventism. What's, what's left on Christ's pattern for Adventism is still in the future. But what should we expect to see next? What does Sister White say is our greatest need? Here's, here's some quotes on the disappointment. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. We're looking for resurrection. Why? Because we're spiritually dead. What would be next? And what happens to Seventh-day Adventists when they finally reflect the character of Christ. You can go to a lot of places, but brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventists are destined to be lifted up before the world as the ensign of, and the issue at the end of time. Review and Herald, June 24th, 1915. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. These prophecies of a great spiritual awakening in a time of gross darkness are today meeting fulfillment in the advancing lines of mission stations that are reaching out into benighted regions of earth. The groups of missionaries in heathen lands have been likened by the prophet to ensigns set up for the guidance of those who are looking for the light of truth. In that day, says Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again at the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. Notice he's setting it up. And other places it's lifted up in the Old Testament. And shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather them together, the dispersed of Judah, from the four corners of the earth. When Seventh-day Adventists are thrown into the flaming, fiery furnace at the Sunday law, the whole world is watching. They're all represented there in Daniel chapter 3. And what do they see? They see Christ walking with them and they're lifted up before the world. And what is their message, and what comes to pass? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And that message leads to and climaxes where? The second coming of Christ. They walk through the identical, we walk through the identical pattern. There is the fall of Babylon, and here is the second coming of Christ. Now, what we're looking for is the last part of this pattern. What passage in Scripture is designed by God to bring this resurrection and ascension to God's people? Same one, brothers and sisters. And this is not an accident. It's not an accident. It's not an accident that the daily is upheld in this pattern, and it's not an accident that the, the passage of Scripture that most clearly portrays the final movements of the Antichrist is the very same passage designed by God to awaken God's people and bring them to life to give the final warning message at the end of time. And it isn't an accident that all of us are here studying that passage of Scripture because it is definitely time for God to awaken His people. We're here.
we're here. And, and this passage of scripture that we're, we're saying to you is the little book open in the hand of Jesus, only he's not coming down in Revelation 10 right now. He's coming down in Revelation 18. What we're saying is when that book can be recognized for what it is, that means that Jesus has brought it down, and that means that we're in the latter rain time period, the sprinkling time period. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy which related to the last days. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. They've paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah. But there's to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. The increase of knowledge on the Sunday law and the papacy comes from Daniel's last vision. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the message of the hour. It is the increase of knowledge that we're waiting for. And uh, I have personal conviction. I have personal conviction even before we started this prophecy school that if we got to this prophecy school it's that at some point in time we had to take time for testimonies. We have to. We have to see if the Holy Spirit wants to make something like that happen here that happened like that in the Millerite time period. Poor English. But is there anyone that has anything to say about what's going on in their life or what's been going on at this school or whatever, whatever the Lord's putting on your heart? Because now is the time. Hi, Mom. I learned that from the video guy. Uh, my name's Dwayne, and I, you all know that, but this is for the sake of the video. And, uh, you know, I was impressed by all the number of people that have uh, been uh, asked to come to this, and I see that everybody here uh, has a, uh, one desire in their hearts, and that is to have a relationship with Jesus that will not only help them to understand the prophecies that we're learning, but this will also have a very close walk with the Savior. Amen. And that's the, the reason I came. How many of you were prevented by the devil from trying to get here? Can you raise your hands? <laughs> okay. I don't know if you can tell the terrible story that I'm about to tell, but I'll make it short. I wasn't going to come because uh, there was problems in me and... Uh, we almost, my wife and I, neither one were coming. I, I had to, my airplane tickets were bought, uh, and she was planning on driving, and I was uh, put under such a heavy, uh, there was such a heavy spiritual battle going on inside of me that uh, I was deciding not to come and just throw the airplane ticket and the money away. But, uh, the other morning when I sat here, I think it was the second morning, the second morning, and uh, I mentioned earlier here this week that Wagner had a, he was in a similar meeting, not for the same reason we're here, but he was in a meeting where Ellen White was speaking, and he saw the cross for the first time, not as just uh, spoken of in, in general terms, the way the Bible presents it to all the world, but it was presented to him personally. Amen. And... You know, I told some other friends here that uh, it was my wife. I always embarrass my wife. And uh, I told some of my friends here today that uh, the number one thing that, we are, uh, that Jesus is showing me today, I mean this week, is that he brought me here to help me see that he really does truly love me. Amen. Okay? And then that means that if I am hearing what he says, uh, that's what Revelation asks us all the time. Do you hear what the Spirit says? That's what it says. Do you have your ears on, he's asking you? And uh, he wants me to have a love for souls that will be genuine enough because of his love for me that I'm going to be able to go home and sit down and get this material between my ears 
so that I'll be able to tell others how much Jesus loves them. Amen. And so that's why I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad that the devil didn't prevent me from getting here. And it, you know, it remind, I'm, no, I, I'm no great man of the earth. I'm just a wretch, saved by grace. But, you know, heaven got me here. The same heaven that uh, helped Cyrus, the angel that wrestled with Cyrus, and so he would give the decree that Jerusalem should be rebuilt, is the same angel that got all of us here for these meetings. If you think it's not true, just pinch yourself because you're here. You're here. And uh, I'm grateful that I'm at these meetings. And, uh, you know, I've been an Adventist for a long time. And I told some friends of mine in a Sabbath school class a, long, a while back here that they were talking about a man who had overcome a heroin addiction, which is great. And we want to say praise the Lord for all those uh, victories that we have in our lives. But in the long run, I told them that the heroin addiction wasn't the man's problem. And the reason I knew that is because Jesus had saved me from many things, the things that I was doing. Jesus doesn't want us to do bad things, just like the children. We don't want our kids to lie and to do bad things and do things that they shouldn't. And Jesus doesn't want us to do bad things either. But the things that makes us do what we do is self. And so uh, I told them in the Sabbath school class that uh, now that Jesus had given this man the victory over his heroin addiction, this man was going to be pleasantly surprised to find that Jesus is going to help him in the greatest battle that he will ever face. And that's the battle with himself. And uh, that's why Jesus has us all here. is because all the prophecies won't do us any good. They won't do us a bit of good unless we understand that when he's knocking on the door of the heart and he wants to come in and sup with us, he wants us to let us know that there is a uh, person that he wants to save from themselves. And Jesus wants to save Dwayne. So I'm grateful I'm here. My name is uh, Bill Gamblin. And I've talked to quite a few, not all of you. But I have a lot to be thankful for. I've spent uh, 22 years of my life in prison because I loved to steal. I was a thief. I loved it. You know, it says in the Bible that there is pleasure in sin for a season. And all during my life, the Lord has always been knocking on my door. But at a very early age, I learned to depend on myself. I was brought up in a foster home that were, they were uh, Advent Christians. Now, I don't know if all of you know what an Advent Christian is, but they was brought up in the Millerite movement too. But they wouldn't accept the Sabbath. But I was always taught the Ten Commandments in church. And so, the time that I was in prison and I picked up the Bible, I was convicted, and I picked up a, the Bible and I started reading for myself, the very first thing I was convicted of was the Sabbath. And I would go to the, uh, the people in the, in the church and, and, and say, well, you know, we're supposed to keep the Sabbath. And, and they would tell me, no, no, that's the Old Testament. We don't have nothing to do with that. But, you know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration. And, <laughs> and if we want to ignore the scriptures... We might as well just throw the book away because it's not doing us no good. But I held up to my conviction that I had to keep the Sabbath. So while I was in prison, I started keeping the, keeping the Sabbath. And <clears throat> I was transferred from the state of Florida. I had to go to North Carolina because I had gotten two 10 years convictions for one for one 10 year for uh, safe cracking, and I got 10 years for breaking and entering. But the Lord even was working with me then because they had it worked out where those two ten years was running together with the five-year sentence I was doing in federal government. So when I got transferred to North Carolina, I, I ended up doing a little over ten months. But while I was there, a guy noticed me reading my Bible, and he says uh, to me, he says, Billy, says, I notice you're reading your Bible all the time. And he says, I have two friends 
that come in and visit me every Sunday, which is the only visiting day they have, he said, would you, would you like to have these uh, people visit you? And I said, well, sure. You know, I mean, if they're Christians, I wanted to associate myself with Christians. Well, I didn't know they were Seventh-day Adventists. I found out later they was, but when they come in, and, and the first thing we studied about was the, uh, was the, uh, the, uh, the death, you know, the, uh, the, the state of the dead. And, and I mean, all they had was the Bible. They didn't have Ellen White's writings. They didn't have the spirit of prophecy. They didn't have nothing. They just had the Bible. And we went through the state of the dead. And, <laughs> and I knew, and he would ask me, well, what I thought. I said, well, it's got to be true because, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's from the Bible. It's God's word. And uh, went through uh, hell, and I went through the whole 27 fundamental beliefs of the, of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I knew what they was telling me was the truth. And, and so I, uh, I accepted it. So, but when I get out, now let me tell you what happens when you get out. You don't have that fellowship. And it's the same way with some of the churches uh, that I went to. They, they, they quit having the uh, Bible study on Wednesday night. That's part of the fellowship. You've got to have that fellowship. But anyway... Uh, I, so I turned away and got back into stealing. And for five years, anything, everything was on my mind was, I just took what I wanted. But then my ex-wife asked me one day, she says, well, don't you have enough? And I kind of said something smart like, well, when's enough enough? And she said, well, when are you going to quit? And I said, well, I can't quit. <laughs> I said, I'm caught up into something that I don't have no control. And brother and sisters, you all know, when you're caught up in sin, there's no control. No control. But I said, but this is what I told her. I says, but when they catch me, I says, I'm going to pick up God's word and I'm not going to lay it down, not for you or for anyone ever again. And when I got back in, and that's what I did, I picked up God's word. I, I was uh, 50 pounds overweight. I had high blood pressure. And the doctors told me I was going to have a heart attack. And I said, well, Doc, why am I in this condition? He says, because of what you eat. And I said, well, I eat everything USDA approved. And of course, he just laughed. But I went back to my cell that day, and I got down on my knees. <laughs> I said, Lord, I've tried it my way, and it's obvious that my way's not working. Look at the shape of me. Look at the condition. I'm going to have a heart attack. I said, right here now, today, I surrender my will to your will. And I started reading God's word, and he was opening the scriptures up to me. And one of the scriptures I, I found was in uh, uh, Psalms 107, verse 17, 18, and 19. It says, fools, because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, whoreth all manners of meat. And in other words, it says it loves all manners of food, in which I did. I love them zuzus and wham whams, I call them. Cakes, the pies, the ice cream, the Doritos and the cheese dip and all that. Well, I, I knew I had to quit. And so I quit doing this stuff. And as I, and as I was, uh, as I quit eating this stuff, because I read in Daniel, and Daniel, this is what really impressed me, is when Daniel purposed in his heart. <laughs> that he wasn't going to eat this stuff. And I said, well, Daniel can do it, I can do it. And with the Lord's help, I was able. Well, I lost the 50 pounds. Uh, the heart condition disappeared. The high blood pressure disappeared. Amen. The Lord give me back my health because his word says he will do that. If I, he said, if you're, you are obedient and true, then that's the first thing he'll give us back, our health, because he wants us to be healthy because if we're healthy, then we can be a good witness. 
because then we can go around. Because in prison, I didn't care where I was. I was free. The Lord finally set me free. And I had Constantine wires and, and barbed wire and fences all around me. And I had roving trucks going around with machine guns. And I was telling everybody I was free. They looked at me like, you're a nut. You're in prison. But you know, I was freer in there because I didn't have that, that guilt. The Lord took that guilt from me. Amen. So as, I, so as the, the weeks and the, the months was going by, I was witnessing to people. I had one guy. I brought him to the Lord. Uh, we walked and we studied. I went to the Revelation seminars with him. He get out. He become a seven day Adventist. He joined the church. He become a deacon. He was uh, active in giving Bible studies, uh, doing outreach and things. But he made a mistake. He was watching people in the church. We can't watch people in the church. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus, because every time we look at someone else, we're going to see the faults in them. We all have faults. Jesus don't have no faults. Amen. Jesus has love for us. He wants us to come to him. And when I surrendered myself to him, now I did six years this last time in prison. And while I was there, I had a problem in talking with people. I, it's the ones I've talked to, I, you probably know that I don't have no problem of talking anymore, but I had a problem of getting up in front and, and, or saying anything to anybody. But the Lord even handled me on that because I joined a group in the federal prison called Life Talks, and we went out into the community. We went to HRS. We went to uh, schools. We went to jails. We went to uh, uh, rehab centers, and we give a 15-minute uh, talk on the choices and consequences, why, why I was in prison, the choices I made to get me there. And I would look at these young kids, and, and they would... They look at you like disgusted, you know, and, and I would tell them at the end, I'd say, you know something, I'm fixing to get out of prison after I end up doing most of my life in there. But I says, you know, you're going to take my place. I can tell by your attitude, you, you're going to take my place. Somebody's got to take my place. And you, and you could tell that it was going it was going to happen. But I get out of prison, and the first thing I'd done was I seek the fellowship that I didn't do before. you got to have that fellowship, because if you don't, it's just like a whirlwind, you go right back in. But to come up here, uh, when uh, we was asked if we would uh, wanted to partake in this, and uh, so I told Jeff, talked to him on the phone, and I said we did. Well, things was working out where I, it might be that I might not come. But my wife and I uh, prayed about it, and we said, well, Lord, if you want me to come, make it so I can't get my truck loaded. So I stayed home a couple of weeks, and then this, other, this last week was coming up, and, and, and normally the people I haul for always got loads, but I just didn't get a load, so I knew the Lord was wanting me here Amen. for a reason. We're all here for a reason, or we wouldn't be here. So... Uh, the Lord answered uh, my wife and, and I my, our prayer, and uh, and I know this message. I've I've seen I've read in uh, different books while I was in prison that I had uh, access to, and uh, a lot of this stuff that Jeff was just going through, uh, I've read in in different books, uh, uh, but I never but it was never put together like this. Described like this, it, it was there. It just wasn't put in, put together like this. And I do prison ministry in the Philippines. And the way this is put together, I can use this when I go in to to, uh, to uh, take the, take the message to these men in prison, because the Lord has turned that whole 22 years around, where now I can go into prison because I know I I can understand these people. I've been there. I remember one time they asked me to get up and give a testimony. I gave my testimony. I said, I've been 22 years in prison. And after we did uh, a couple of uh, meetings, I, 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 I wanted to cut them short because I wanted the men to exercise their faith and get up and, and, and tell us 
what the Lord done in their life. Because if we never do that, if somebody don't give us a chance, we might just let it pass by. But if you let them get up, you let them express what the Lord's done in their life. And this one guy get up and he says, I'm not going to be like this guy. I'm not spending no 22 years of my life in prison. But you know, it's, the Lord turned that thing, that whole, my whole life has been a wreck. But the Lord used that. So now I can turn it around and I can reach out and touch other people. And that's what it's all about, the Lord in us. It's not me standing up here, it's Jesus standing up here. It's God living in me. My wife and I had a dedication prayer when we got married. And it started like, the, the beginning was that, Father, in the name of Jesus, I commit myself to walk in your word. <laughs> your word living in me produces your life in this world. And that's what it is. It's his word in each one of us. That produces his life. And that's what I seen when them two seven-day Adventists came into prison to study with me. I seen something in them that I wanted. I seen that joy and that peace that they had. And see, that's what people got to see in us. They got to see that joy and that peace and that happiness in us. And then, and then we can study with them and we can draw them to the Lord. But I just give God the praise. He gets all the praise. I don't get nothing. The Lord asked me to open my door. He come and knocked on my heart, but he says, Bill, I want you to open it. And that's what I did. I opened the door. And I just praise God for it. I just had a, a short testimony. Oh, my name is Bud Alavisos. I just had a short testimony there's been a song going through my mind the last few days called Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Uh, for some reason, it's real easy, like Jeff said, uh, we, we do have to get all these idols out of our lives. And I, I know an honest look at my own life, and I see idols in my life. I definitely need people's prayer, and I'm betting that there aren't a number of people just like me out here. We need to be praying for one another. That's all I wanted to say. Well, about a month ago or two months ago, I guess it is, Jeff was in Remnant Church in Riverside and I was trying to record what he was doing there and it um, didn't work too well. But he asked me to come here and I was never been so surprised in my life when he asked me and I wouldn't uh, miss this for anything. And I already had a vacation this year. I took two weeks off and went to Alaska with my relatives. That kind of a uh, thing I'll have to do every couple of years with my family. But I uh, asked my boss if I could come. And just a week or so ago, he says, well, he says, you're uh, 18 hours short on time off. He says, I could keep you from going, but I won't. And the secret is I would have come anyway. <laughs> And I didn't know exactly why Jeff wanted me to come, but I says, uh, what are you going to do for a PA? He says, well, I'm not going to have a PA uh, except this thing here. And he uh, says, well, what are you going to do about recording? He says, well, I'm not going to record. You're going to take it off the video. I says, well, that doesn't sound too good. I'm going to come and record. And so I started collecting equipment. I ordered a soundboard. It came in about three days, ordered a wireless microphone, which we're not using, but I needed anyway, because somebody had stolen the one I used in the church in Blythe. And um, it, it took a long time to show up. I thought it might not come. I had to order it from Sure, because it had to be a particular frequency. And it came. And when I went to put all this stuff in the car, I just got this little Jeep. Everything fit in just like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. They got all, all that sound equipment in the back. Nothing could rattle. It all just fit in like somebody designed it to fit. These speakers are I borrowed from the Isbany Church where we go in Corona I and mean, in uh, Blythe. So it's thanks to them. The rest of the stuff I just had and put it together. I came here and met Glenn and we 
put together a system that's working very well, except for a few glitches. I finally figured out how to not screw up the tapes, and we're doing a pretty good job. And uh, so for me, nothing kept us from coming. Everything is going great, and I'm having lots of fun. Praise the Lord. I don't give that many testimonies. But I uh, grew up in Long Island, New York. When I was 17, I went in the Navy, and the Navy dropped me off out in Ridgecrest, California, which is out in the Mojave Desert. And um, I, I'm not a perfectionist, but I try to do everything very well. And back then, I was a long-haired hippie, and I tried to do that very well, and I ended up with a nickname which was given to me, which was called Super Hippie. And um, it's a good thing that Jeff and I never met because we were probably along similar lines and would have had a good time together. <laughs> but uh, met my wife when I was 26, and she was a backslidden Adventist. And I met her out in the world doing what I was doing. And we got married, and then we realized that we had nothing in common. And when, and when I had decided that I didn't want to be a zombie anymore and I wanted to quit smoking pot, when I was straight, we didn't get along. And we ended up on what I called divorce row, because we were ready, we were going to get a divorce. And I had a one-year-old son, and my wife was pregnant, and I grew up with a stepfather. And for me, it was just not an option, even the thought that my son was going to have a stepfather. And even though there were Adventists around me, it took a charismatic Christian um, from the Calvary Chapel to start showing me the Word of God out of the Living Bible. And with really not knowing much in the Bible, on the f talking to my friend on the phone one day, I was on my knees crying and I gave my heart to the Lord. And from that moment on, my wife and I started getting along. And so I, uh, within so many weeks or whatever, I drug my wife with me to church on Sunday and that's all it took. We got home, and she pointed out Sabbath in the Bible. She just couldn't handle going on Sunday, even though she doesn't go to church, or she didn't back then. And so I started going to the Adventist church. And I remember the first time I stepped into church, I mean, I'm Jewish, and I was on fire, because I, I had a very contrasty conversion. And we go in this church, and the first sermon is on, uh, oh, um, giving, you know, pay your tithe and offering. I forget the title of it. Uh, but um, and it was dead. This other church was kind of lively. I mean, I didn't put my hands up like they did, but this church was like, hey, this is the Sabbath, and it's, it's just dead in there. Well, it was a short matter of time, and I met Jeff, and before you know it, we're going out, and we're giving Bible studies once a week, and Jeff, back then, uh, the sanctuary was his main forte with, you know, within Daniel and Revelation, and we were driving around one night, and we were just talking to the Lord, you know, Lord, we're having a good time doing this, yeah. You know, you could open the door for a few more, and all of a sudden, four and five nights a week, we're going out and giving Bible studies. My wife's kind of missing me at home, but I'm just, for about a year, year and a half, I'm just growing by leaps and bounds, and Jeff and I were really good about it. I was always, right in the beginning, I'm throwing the spirit of prophecy out there, but Jeff had a good way of smoothing it over, you know, and, and it always worked out, and we had a, we had a really good time, and, and then I moved up to Hope International, and, and Jeff followed me up there, and... Then uh, Future for America was dumped in his lap, kind of, and, and he ended up out here. And so it's, I, I praise the Lord for his leading because uh, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, and so is he. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more, but it should be from someone out of the United States probably, but I'm not going to put any pressure on anyone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Junior Scott for the camera, but everyone else we've met already. I just want to thank the Lord for bringing me here because I prayed before. When I heard about the trip, I prayed. I didn't have the money to come because we just previously come back from Jamaica, spend a month out there, so we didn't have any money. And I just put it to the Lord. I said, Lord, you know I don't have any money, so if you want me to go, you're going to have to provide the money. You're going to have to provide the funds. You're going to have to open the way and make it way clear. And I, I knew that. I said, Lord, if you really want me to be here, if you know this is the place where your spirit will be, the way will be smooth. I know that even though Satan tries to throw obstacles in the way, the Lord will not block that obstacle if you have a desire to want to know the truth. And I couldn't believe, 
even though obstacles came, it's just like they were just being plucked out of the way. Everything just went smooth. There was nothing, no, the money just came just like that. Someone said, if you don't need the money, you can go. And even with work and everything, the opportunities for me to get the place from work, to leave from work, not a problem. So I truly am thanking the Lord for being here because I've been here, have been well and truly blessed. Yeah. Not only from the messages, but what I'm seeing is that this message not only brings about a revival, but it also brings about, it brings a people who study this message close together. I've never felt in a, um, seen so many different people, but even though we're all so many different people from so many different places, it's just like, we I've seen, feel like we've known each other for years, yes. even though we don't. So one thing I do see is this message will bring God's people together. We need to get into the word more, get into this message, and you'll see the unity that will become a come from God's people, and a resurrection, a revival will take place amongst us. The only thing I re regret in is that I don't have enough money in my bank now to bring to ring people and even tell them to come over for the last few days to join in with us and see, and see if they will not be truly blessed. So I want to just truly thank the Lord and I, I encourage the, everyone who's watching these videos to prove these things, check everything, and you'll see. And you know that the Lord is with this message. Amen. Shall we pray? <clears throat> <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we spent with you this day. We thank you for the testimonies we've just heard. We acknowledge that we are all being worked with through your spirit, through providence. And we ask you to continue this work you've begun in us and finish it, uh, that we might be among those that are lifted up here at the end and give this final warning message. We thank you um, for bringing us from so far around the world and bringing this unity and fellowship together. And as we part here this evening, we ask for um, rest and uh, we ask for your blessing for those that are going in town. Give them traveling to mercies. And we know that we all have families at home. We ask that you'd watch over and um, protect them while we're away. Please bring us back in the morning where we can um, start once again back into this prophetic study. In Jesus' name, amen.